Thank you for joining us on the Beyond Sunday podcast. You are watching the Beyond Sunday podcast. Our goal is not to declare a right or wrong view, but to explore some differing views that many different sincere believers in Christ may hold. And as believers, we have to agree on the essentials of the faith, but on some of the peripherals, we can have grace and freedom as we try and seek God together and understand the greatest mystery of the universe. So our hope is through these discussions that we do on this segment is to look at multiple different sides of any given issue as we grow together in our own understanding and maybe see why someone else might believe the way that they do and hopefully maybe bring some unity to the church no matter where and how we might worship. Yep. So today on this episode of Be- uh, Beans in Theology, we want to look at two different views about Scripture, the views of inerrancy and infallibility. Great. So we're going to dive in. As believers, we all agree that the Bible is God's inspired word. We see in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, Paul explains this, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Mm -hmm. So as we look at Paul's words, we see that the Bible is not just inspiring but it's our authority on all matters of faith. Sure, fair enough. So there, there are varying thoughts, though, on the nature of Scripture's accuracy. Right. Inerrancy holds um, that Scripture is without error and has no error in fact or in statement in all that it teaches, yep. no matter the subject. Okay. And infallibility says that Scripture is trustworthy and incapable of making a mistake in matters of faith and spiritual practice infallibility and inerrancy are not the same. However, infallibility infallibility is contained within inerrancy. Right. So inerrancy is generally a higher and tighter standard of accuracy while examining Scripture. Great. So with, with that understanding, let's start with inerrancy. Inerrancy is kind of more of a recent term uh, in theological discussions. It came into common use around the 1970s. And the view of inerrancy, though, the kind of that general concept, though, is not new. Been around a long time. The view of inerrancy says that the Bible is not only without error in areas of faith, but also in regard to history, science, or anything that it discusses. So adherence to this view would hold that Scripture has no real actual errors. Even though there may be the appearance of errors, the appearance of errors may simply be things that we don't understand at this point. So inerrancy is actually based on the accuracy of the original Scripture, so as they were originally penned down by the authors, and it doesn't count any errors that may have crept in over the centuries due to copying errors or or anything like that. Right. So even with the potential, though, of copying errors that that they would agree may have come into place, they would say that Scripture, even today, is still very close to the original, even though it is not necessarily identical. The standard of inerrancy applies to the author's original intent and the context in which they wrote things in. And since the Word is inspired, it must be completely true since God doesn't lie. And we can see that in Numbers 23, 19, Titus 1, 2, or 1 Samuel 15, 29. So God's promises are all true, and what he says must come to pass. Yep. Jesus himself trusted Scripture. He quoted it. And since Jesus trusted all of Scripture, so should we. Jesus said that nothing of the law would pass, stating that Scripture is firm and immovable. And we can see that in Matthew five eighteen or in Luke sixteen seventeen. And Hebrews 6 even tells us that it is impossible for God to lie or be wrong. So we would go so far then to say that if Scripture has errors, then Jesus was wrong as well, and that can't be the case. So Scripture is without any real errors. So let's take a look at some of the support for inerrancy. There are a number of points that that support the view, and the first is church tradition. Theologians often hold to this view. Augustine said that no author of Scripture made any errors in their writing. Mm, okay. Luther said Scripture does not err, and Calvin said that the Bible is the unerring standard. Okay. 
Several other positions can be taken to defend the position. Now, logically speaking, God is perfect, and since Scripture is God-inspired, there just couldn't be an error in Scripture. Mm. Another supporting argument says that if we don't hold to inerrancy, then we must decide for ourselves where it's in error and where it's not. Okay, that's pretty rough. This starts to bring in some challenges. Mm -hmm. If we do this, then we're judging Scripture rather than letting it have authority over us. Okay. Now, once we sit as the judge, we may find ourselves dismissing real truth all of a sudden as a cultural trend Mm -hmm. from the time. Mm -hmm. Dismissing inerrancy opens a dangerous door because we are self-deceiving naturally. Jeremiah says that our hearts are completely deceptive. Mm -hmm. We're rebellious, and we make allowances for our own thoughts, feelings, and our beliefs. We, We always have. So looking at the fullness of Scripture, the view of inerrancy shows that some parts of Scripture can't be examined as directly true or false as well. Okay. Some areas, such as the Psalms, show the heart of the writer. They're mm-hmm. an emotional Sense. outpouring, which really just it can't be judged in that way. They aren't facts to be weighed, but they do convey truth still. Sure, fair enough. Now, there are some avo- opposing views um, that object, saying that the Bible does contain errors and contradictions. The errors are there to see, uh, and that has to be accounted for. The inerrant view would ask, though, what do we place our authority in? Do we trust the Scripture or an apparent contradiction? Mm -hmm. Do we throw out the accuracy of Scripture just because of an apparent error, or do we begin with the belief that Scripture is accurate and examine any difficulties through that lens, trusting that God's Word is accurate and beginning from that? The inerrant view states that we can account for alleged errors. Uh, If we understand the context, the perspective, any cultural issues, we may see that these aren't, in fact, errors. We also have to understand that the ancient narrative structure, they were different than our present ways of writing. Additionally, the standard of details, orders, those those kinds of things are different than the way we tell stories and convey information now. And we have to understand that when we read Scripture in its context. The inerrant view would also say that only original manuscripts are absolutely inerrant. Uh, If we could examine those, we would see that perfect inerrancy. Mm -hmm. And even though we don't have the originals, we can still see that the part of Scripture originally that we do... uh, have and we're able to examine has a high degree of accuracy all throughout. Okay, so now let's take a look at the infallibility view. Okay. That's the second view, um, and this view would state that Scripture is reliable and accurate in all matters of faith. Scripture may not have a full view on every subject, right. though. The infallibility view also holds that Scripture communicates the will of God. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see that in Luke chapter 16, verse 17. John chapter 10, verse 35, and that is steadfast and true. Scripture is clearly inspired by God um, from 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 through 21, and it's useful for our equipping in the faith, yet we don't have a full or clear idea of how people were inspired. Each writer has their own views, their own personalities, their own perspective, Mm -hmm. and specific circumstances that they lived with. Mm -hmm. While inspired, they're each still completely human with human understanding. So as we look at some of the descriptive Old Testament language, we can see it is inaccurate. You know, Hmm. dome of heaven, pillars of earth, windows of heaven. The writer still uses these ancient word pictures and views that were common of ancient language. It's culturally fitting but inaccurate as it doesn't match with what we actually observe. Mm -hmm. So this view would point that these um, errors um, are errors of understanding. We also see contradictions in Scripture even among the Gospels. Mm. We can see differences in the specific instructions that Jesus gave to the Twelve as he sent them out. Matthew chapter 10, verse 9 through 10, Mm -hmm. Mark 6, 8 through 9, and Luke chapter 9, verse 3. Okay or the different depictions in the healing of the centurion's servant Mm -hmm. in Luke chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 8. Okay. While we can gain full understanding and make sense of the apparent differences, we still have to acknowledge that there's differences. They don't affect the teaching or the point of the text. We can still put our trust in God 
but the writers didn't record the same event the same way. Hmm. So there has to be an error somewhere. Okay. Now, looking at the infallibility view, there's support for this position, and they would argue that while inerrancy has come from the church tradition, infallibility uh, can look to church history for its support. So some theologians have said that Scripture uh, shouldn't be used in matters of science. In fact, some of the battles against scientists, the Church has suffered some embarrassment in the past for some of their rigid stances holding to the exact inerrant view. Now, this view might argue that holding Scripture more openly prevents a person of faith from being backed into a corner. You know, I don't have to hold to every single word. Right. But a proponent of this view uh, could also argue that infallibility opens uh, a door for evangelism. Inerrancy has to answer every single error or contradiction. And for some, that can create a stumbling block on a person's faith journey, making it hard to reach some nonbelievers. Also, uh, some might argue that this view avoids an error that comes from some that hold the inherent view. Some may move from faith in Jesus uh, to the accuracy of the Bible, making the Bible itself an idol. Yeah. You know, the, the Bible is my standard, not actually Jesus. So infallibility by holding scriptures, having some potential errors, would protect against that potential issue. Right. So and the response to the infallibility um, argument would, the counters, so, so one of the counters to infallibility is mm-hmm. that if we say one part of scripture is wrong— how can we be certain that any of it's right? Okay. That's... Um, slippery slope. Yeah, right. Um, infallibility would say that while it creates challenges, it's not so big of a concern to force inerrancy to be true. Okay. Additionally, we regularly accept things that we agree with and believe are accurate in some respects while they're not actually true in every aspect. Okay. For instance, most of society has marked Starbucks as the pinnacle of coffee quality and taste. Okay. We all know that's not true. Many know there's better quality of coffee and taste out there, but we still proclaim the greatness of Starbucks because, after all, they kind of own the coffee world. And so they carry part of it. Infallibility, additionally, (laughs) would point out that both positions have to agree that a modern Bible has some textual errors. Okay. While God is without error... The people that he uses are not without error. True enough. They are still very human. Mm -hmm. While inspired by a perfect God, Mm -hmm. they're not perfect themselves, and that obviously leaves them open to some errors. Uh, Fair point. Now, regardless of the specific position, both sides agree that the core of the Bible is completely true and accurate in what it says about God specifically, his will, and what God intends for each of us. And our hope is is that maybe by looking at this a little bit, it's been helpful for each of us as we uh, grow in our faith and understand the various elements of our theology. Yeah. So that's all we have for this time, and we'll see you next time for another cup and another look at our faith. Have a good one. This has been another episode of the Beyond Sunday podcast. And don't forget, like, share, and subscribe.